An important testament to the power of the Hittite Empire before its demise is preserved in Egypt, a land that was once its enemy. The two pillars at the entrance to the Temple of Luxor on the Nile are adorned with scenes of the battle fought between the Hittites and the Egyptians in 1295 BC at Kadesh in Syria. The great Ramses II, the warrior Pharaoh, is seen fighting from his chariot and leaving behind victims among the ranks of the Hittite army led by King Muatalas. Who won this epic conflict? In this bas-relief at Luxor, the Egyptians claimed a triumphant victory. This version of the facts was never disputed until archaeological excavations in the first decades of the 20th century uncovered some ancient Hittite cities. Over 10,000 clay tablets engraved with cuneiform characters came to light in buildings at Hattashash, the capital of the empire. One of these tablets, preserved at the Archaeology Museum in Istanbul, bears the inscription, Kadesh Peace Treaty. The treaty lays down conditions imposed on the Egyptians, including one to retreat inside their borders. So more than 3,000 years after the event, thanks to this tablet, we now know that it was the Hittites and not the Egyptians who really won that conflict. Over the centuries, Asia Minor has seen numerous civilizations flourish. After the Hittites, the country reached a high civil and cultural level thanks to populations of Greeks who had settled along its coasts. Later on, during the period of Roman rule, Asia Minor became one of the richest provinces of the empire. Turkey was also the cradle of the great Byzantine Empire an evolution of the equally famous Eastern Roman Empire. We will journey back in time, starting in the 6th century AD, and explore the great civilizations that flourished on the Turkish coasts and highlands. Ankara is currently the capital of Turkey. But for centuries, the real capital of this part of the world was Byzantium, later called Constantinople, then renamed Istanbul. Byzantium was full of dazzling monuments. One of them was the Karnak Obelisk, erected at the city's famous circus grounds in the first half of the fifth century AD. At the front of the base, there are portrayals of family members of Emperor Theodosius II, along with court dignitaries, watching circus chariot races from an elevated stand. On one of the sides, there is a depiction of the transport and erection of the obelisk itself. For centuries, Byzantium, or Constantinople, was the preeminent city of the entire Byzantine Empire. It boasted a modern plan and many infrastructures. At the Hippodrome is the Basilican Cistern, a gigantic underground tank constructed perhaps early in the 4th century AD by Emperor Constantine. Its name derives from the fact that it was enlarged using the uncovered area of a nearby basilica. What is exceptional is its 336 columns, all supporting the masonry vault. But certainly the most famous building of 6th century Byzantium is the Church of St. Sophia, or Dome of Hagi Sophia, rebuilt as it appears today by Emperor Justinian. Its original appearance was altered after the Ottomans invaded the city. The church was turned into a mosque and four characteristic minarets were added. Beautiful Byzantine mosaics covered with plaster in 1700 were brought to light in the 20th century when the mosque was turned into the Hagia Sophia or Hagi Sophia Museum. Saint Sophia was known as the incarnation of divine wisdom. 
praying to her in this divine basilica must have filled thousands of visitors over the years with a sense of spirituality and grace. In the southwestern part of Turkey is the city of Aphrodisias, dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite, or Venus to the Romans. Founded in the 5th century BC, Aphrodisias became very important during the Greek-Roman era. Worship of the goddess at the sanctuary here spread throughout the Mediterranean area. Important archaeological discoveries have been made here since the 1960s. One of the most stunning sights is this gigantic stadium. Erected in the first century AD, it was over 850 feet long, and its original seats are still intact, arranged neatly in 30 rows. It is one of the world's best preserved ancient stadiums. In the middle of Aphrodisia stood the Agora, a rectangular market area surrounded on three sides by marvelous colonnades. The columns were surmounted by decorated capitals and architraves, which can now be seen in the garden of the Aphrodisias Museum. The theater here, which dates back to the end of the second century AD, is also in a superb state of preservation. It has a capacity of 10,000 spectators. Built by Julius Zolios, it was dedicated to Aphrodite and the city. Zolios was a native of Aphrodisias and a former slave of Emperor Augustus. He did the city a very important service by having it obtain the special status of autonomous city exempt from taxes. The most sacred site in the city, of course, was the Sanctuary of Aphrodite. This is the Tetrapylon, the gateway to the sanctuary. The Tetrapylon was originally composed of four rows of four columns each. Many of the spiral fluted columns are still standing, with their gables still in place. Today, the Tetrapylon is an isolated monument but in ancient times a compound and a road connected it with the temple of Aphrodite. The temple itself was rebuilt in the first century BC with eight columns on the short sides and 15 on the long sides. The sanctuary was famous in ancient times for the practice of sacred prostitution that had its roots in ancient fertility and reproduction rites. During the Christian Byzantine period, however, to help the population forget these pagan practices, the Temple of Aphrodite was turned into a church, and Aphrodisias was renamed Stavropolis, meaning City of the Cross. Not far from Aphrodisias lies the present-day center of Parmukale, famous for its natural cliffs that are formed by basins of limestone arranged on sloping white terraces. Parmukale is the site of ancient Hierapolis, founded by the king of Pergamum in 190 BC. It was destroyed and rebuilt several times and reached the height of its development between the second and third centuries AD when it was inhabited by Greeks, Romans and Jews. By the 6th century in the Christian era, the city had become a bishopric. However, this did not prevent people from continuing to worship Pluto, the great pagan god of the underworld. Pluto's realm, the House of Hades, or Kingdom of the Dead, was thought to be located beneath the earth. Worshippers, part of a thonic cult, perhaps thought the god had access to the kingdom of the dead somewhere under the ground at Hierapolis. In the 6th century, a monumental colonnaded road that was nearly one mile long and 43 feet wide crossed the city. 
Near the colonnaded street, there was a central fountain and a pond containing water believed to have healing properties. It's now been turned into a swimming pool for tourists. The theater built in the second century AD is in such good shape it could probably be used today. Since 1957, Italian archaeologists have been bringing to light the cavia, 26 magnificent tiers of seating, along with marble reliefs that recount the myths of Apollo and Artemis. The cemetery of the city extended beyond the Byzantine walls. More than a thousand tombs have been discovered here. In the center of the ancient city, however, is probably where the so-called Plutonium, or Sanctuary of Pluto, was erected. It is believed by some that the sanctuary was completely underground, most likely in this cave that in ancient times was called the Cave of the Underworld and the Demons. An ancient traveler wrote, Every animal that goes into the cave dies at once. In reality, there could have been poisonous gases circulating in the cave. How then did the priests freely enter and leave the grotto? They probably realized that the toxic substance was heavier than air and settled at the bottom of the cave. It was therefore only harmful to small animals who wandered that far. Naturally, only select Pluto worshippers were in on this secret. Another fascinating locale in ancient times was Gordium, or Alasar Huyuk, roughly 50 miles from Ankara. Gordium was the capital of Phrygia, an ancient region of Anatolia that was named after the Phrygians, the people who lived there from approximately 1200 BC. The Phrygians are believed to be one of the peoples of the sea, responsible for destroying the Hittite Empire. Originally from Thrace, a region at the easternmost tip of the Balkan Peninsula, the Phrygians reached the height of their power around the 8th century BC. Archaeologists have found the remains of the city walls of Gordium and Megarons, the great halls that belong to the complex of the royal palace and stand out for their size. Excavations have also uncovered decorative elements and furnishings, now preserved at the museum of Anatolian civilizations in Ankara. But one of the greatest discoveries concerned the first great king of Phrygia, the mythical and legendary King Midas. It was said that Dionysius gave him the power to turn everything he touched into gold. In 1949, an American archaeological expedition discovered his tomb thereby turning a mythical personality into a historical figure. The tomb was 820 feet in diameter and 174 feet high. To access the burial chamber, archaeologists had to dig a 230-foot long tunnel. They ended up in a spacious hall measuring 20 by 17 feet that was entirely wood paneled. This is the tomb of King Midas rebuilt at the Ankara Museum. The corpse was laid on a wooden bed and bone analysis has proven that at the time of death the man was about 60 years old and slightly over five feet tall. Working from the skull that was found this is what King Midas would have looked like. His burial kit included tripods, bronze basins, caskets and other objects but strangely enough, for the tomb of the legendary King Midas, there was not even one gold item. Moving further east, we come to the ruins of the great city of the Hittite Empire in the heart of the Anatolian highlands, Hattashash, present-day Boakoi. The Hittites were a people of Indo-European origin who arrived there around the end of the third millennium BC, from regions situated north of the Black Sea. Deciphering the tablets of the Hattashash archives has revealed aspects of the social and political life of the Hittites, as well as the triumphs of their kings and armies, 
Though most of the significant traces of this ancient civilization have disappeared, one strong archaeological find remains. The Great Hittite Sanctuary at Yazilikia, near Hattashash, erected in 1400 BC. The sanctuary was thought to have been inhabited by wicked pagan gods. Today, it yields incredible evidence of the Hittite civilization. The sanctuary is composed of two environments, dug into a 40-foot high block of rock that archaeologists have divided into Chamber A and Chamber B. Both rooms are decorated with bas-reliefs sculpted on the bare walls. Chamber A contains a depiction of two processions. One is mostly composed of male figures. The other procession, composed of female figures, is headed by a divinity, probably the sun goddess, Hepat. Not far away, a small entrance flanked by two demons with the body of a lion leads to Chamber B, measuring 60 feet by 10 feet. Twelve figures with similar garments and bearing stand out on one wall. There is also a representation of a gigantic sword more than ten feet high, illustrated as if it is penetrating the rock. The heads of four lions form the handle, with a human head at the top. What could this design have meant? The mystery was unraveled by a description found in a Hittite ritual text. The sword is a symbol of Nurgle, the dreaded god of pestilence and the underworld, often depicted by multi-headed lions. Likewise, the discovery of bird skeletons here, creatures that were traditionally sacrificed to underground deities, convinced scholars that the room was used for worshipping the dead. Yazalikia managed to survive the many wars that engulfed the Hittite Empire, unlike Hattashash, which was destroyed and rebuilt several times. The oldest evidence of dwellings here dates as far back as the end of the third millennium BC, but the layout for the real town seems to have been developed around 1650 BC. Hattashash was built on three levels, an upper city, the citadel or acropolis, a lower city, completely surrounded by walls that took advantage of the rocky nature of the land, and a 4,000-foot-high plateau, surrounded by steep walls and rocky gorges. The walls formed a circuit that was about three and a half miles long. Above an earth bulwark, 30 feet high, they had erected crenellated walls alternated with mighty rectangular towers. This discovery allowed archaeologists to understand how the wall was made. It was only one of a treasure trove of finds in the area. Archaeologists also found the so-called Royal Gate, or Gate of the Kings. Two towers flanked the gateway, and bronze-plated gates probably provided additional defense. Two great statues of the war god dominated the entrance hall. This is a copy. The original is at the Ankara Museum. Beneath another gate, the Sphinx Gate, there was an entrance formed by a 260-foot-long tunnel, which was probably shut off at each end by huge doors. Only after a long walk in the dark did visitors reach the bright sunlight of the city. To the west, there was the Lion Gate. Two lions sculpted on the jams with menacing, wide-open jaws, the symbolic guardians of the city. From the excavations, it appears there was no specific city plan. The streets must have been winding and haphazard. In the upper city, archaeologists found many buildings that they've identified as temples. The huge stones making up the construction are perfectly aligned, without any spaces between them, a method also utilized by the Incas in South America thousands of years later. In the lower city, 
probably the most ancient part of the settlement, stood the great sacred complex archaeologists identified as Temple One. It is a square-shaped urban area that is roughly 980 feet on each side and cut in two by a stately paved street. King Hattusili III had it built around the middle of the 13th century BC. Here they worshipped the sacred couple formed by Hati, the weather god, and Arena, the sun goddess. The many rooms surrounding the temple, characterized by enormous aligned jars, were probably necessary for the sanctuary's elaborate religious rites and festivals that were put on before very large crowds. An overhanging rock, now called by the Turkish name of Bulukale, dominated the city. Bulukale was the Acropolis, or citadel, and was the site of the king's residence. It was a natural fortress, a plateau measuring 650 by 500 feet, and every inch of space was utilized. With the gates, the towers, the walls, buildings, and royal palace, the citadel was a formidable site. The structures were of many shapes and sizes, and were generally planned to face a courtyard. The walls were crenellated, meaning they were notched for battlements, and all around there were towers to add to the defense. The purposes of all the different buildings have not been discovered. Naturally, some were used as living spaces, some seemed to be auditoriums, others had religious functions. But the capacity of the citadel was immense. According to an inscription on one of the tablets, a king of Hadashash, after returning from a military expedition, managed to lock up as many as 3,330 prisoners in the royal palace. So what happened to the Hittites? Once their cities were destroyed, they apparently just scattered throughout the countryside. After the Hittites, hundreds of different armies and peoples settled in or simply passed through the regions of the Anatolian highlands. Centrally located, it was a focal point for passage east and west. An ancient poem about the people who lived in this region says, We are what we've been. A thousand faces have preceded us, and those faces are still found in a thousand glances.